Good evening and welcome. We're glad that you're here. If you're visiting, we are certainly glad that you're here and ask that you uh, stay around for a few moments after the service that we can uh, say hi and get to know you a little bit better. And if we can be of any service to you, please uh, let us know. If you're visiting, you'll notice on the seat back in front of you some visitor's cards. And if you're willing, please take one of those and fill it out and pass it toward the center aisles. The ushers will be by in just a few moments to pick those up. Our next time of service will be this Wednesday evening for midweek Bible study, and we, uh, of course, hope that you choose to join us at 7 o'clock this Wednesday evening. Uh, continue to remember those that are in the uh, bulletin for uh, the prayers. Also remember to get uh, your prayer list or your, your sick list as you leave. Um, it's on the table there. Use that as a contact sheet or a reminder during the week. Asked Emmett if he had any uh, update on Totsi, and he said he's still basically the same and uh, still uh, no visitors. So just continue to remember uh, Totsi as you, uh, as you pray. Continue to remember all those on the list. And uh, I th I've, again, the latest I heard on Ms. Shelby is that, uh, Lord willing, she'll be able to leave midweek to come back home. There will be a Teen Devo tonight uh, after services. It will... Rick's going to be here, I think, for a while. Yeah. Right. So you just watched a kind of a real-time negotiation work out there. Um, so yeah, there, 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 there will, there will be that that provided. And if you want to stay um, for that, feel feel free to. And Rick, Rick, uh, and crowd will be here until about eight or eight eight thirty or so, something like that. Again, uh, on uh, the. The youth list, the youth uh, newsletter, if you have any updates, please get those to Seth or, or Jill as, as soon as you can. Also, the hotline list, don't forget that sheet outside the uh, secretary's office if you want to update that. The softball team, Madison County High School softball team, is having a pancake breakfast. We mentioned that this morning. It's February the 18th. If you'd like to purchase tickets, you can see Hayden Van Holzer, Sidney Gothart, or Beth Maples. Tickets are $5, and again, that's February the, the 18th. Ushers, if you'll pick up any cards, please. Yvonne Han found out on Ryland Pike um, this Bible out in the middle of the of the road, uh, which it could be anyone from any congregations, but it had one of our blue visitors cards in it, so she figured there's a good chance that it belonged to someone here. I'll uh, place this right up here on the pulpit. If you has no obviously no name in it, but if it looks like yours, I'll place it right here. You feel free to uh, to come inspect that after services. Our first song will be song number 313, 313. Again, song number 313. Our opening prayer will be Brother Pat Bradford, and closing prayer will be Kyle Trailer. Brother Pat comes. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for the blessings that you give us for the blessings that we've had in worshiping today and coming before your throne with singing and prayer to make our petitions known to you. Father, we thank you for this time of worship that we've had both this morning and that we have now, that we may open our hearts to you, that we might be lifted up as we lift our voices to you. Father, we ask that you bless those that were mentioned tonight, those that are ill, those that are that are hurting, we ask, Father, that you restore them, if it be your will, and bring them back to their place here. Father, we ask you to bless those missionaries that we have sent from this place, that their work may bear fruit for your kingdom, that they may bring souls to you. And Father, help us to be lights in, in this area, that we may show your good works, that people may see you through us. Father, as we go through this time now, draw our hearts closer to you. Let us be attentive to those words that you send to us, that we may take them in, that we may use them, that we may bring glory to your name. Keep us always in your care, Father. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Three hundred thirteen. We'll do the first and last stanzas, please. <clears throat> the harvest call comes and I go, I go and seek some struggling soul to say, I go, I go, I go. I'll spread 
828. 828. Again, we'll do the first and last. 828. <clears throat> Lean on the mighty arm of Jesus. Hide in the about that one. You just have to grab it. 661. 661. <clears throat> First and last of this. <clears throat> there is a gate that stands ajar and through its portals gleaming a from the cross afar the Savior's love revealing yes in the blood of Christ I see the gift that stands ajar for me for me, for me, that stands a joy for me, press onward then, though fools may frown, while mercy's gate is Accept the cross and win the crown. Love's everlasting joy, God. Yes, in the blood of Christ, I see the gate that stands a joy. Seventy-one, five hundred seventy-one. <clears throat> First and third. <clears throat> Seeking the lost is kindly entreating wonders on the mountainous tree. Come and me.
Seven, three hundred ninety seven. <clears throat> First and the last. <clears throat> Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his lighthouse evermore, but to Mark 337, 337, that'll be our song to encourage tonight after the lesson. <clears throat> now number 660, number 660. <clears throat> do the first third in the last stanzas. If you'd like to, please stand. We'll sing it together. 660. <clears throat> there is a
Lisa. We are glad to see you this evening. We appreciate your attendance here. I'm using this as a benchmark. Since I announced this morning that my sermon would be short, I figured if the attendance was up a lot, obviously people were interested in short sermons. It's not. It's obvious that you want them long all the time. <clears throat> Just kidding. I realized after I left this morning that I'd written Carrie a blank check by stating exactly when I'd planned to stop. I didn't say when I was going to get to start, but uh, we'll, we'll look toward that end and do so appropriately. I read a little story about uh, a lady who was in her kitchen, and she was looking out the kitchen window when a couple of the gas uh, men came up to look at her house, check the meter and such. And uh, the, the two gas guys that were there from the gas company, one of them was an older supervisor who was training a new guy on a, on a new route. Well, he was a little feisty that day, and, and uh, he was ribbing the younger guy because the younger guy had been talking about the old guy and how that he couldn't do anything anymore. And he said, well, let's just race back to the truck. And so uh, they said, go, and off they ran to the truck. Well, about the time they get there, they turn around, and here's the lady huffing and puffing in her bathrobe. And uh, the, uh, the supervisor turned around and she said, ma'am, is, is everything okay? She said, well, I don't know. When you see two gas guys running from your house as fast as you can, you go with them. <laughs> everything in life that involves running may not be sports related. Sometimes there's running that is about life. I want to start our thoughts in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And, and I will uh, tell you from the outset, our lesson tonight is a little more lighthearted than we often uh, are involved with, more application-oriented. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and following, let's read. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul, the apostle, lived in a time where sports were known. World sporting events have been going on for a very, very long time. I thought about using the Super Bowl illustrations tonight more, but uh, that just didn't work out as good. So I've, I've chosen as the, the fabric for our discussion more um, illustrations from the, the concepts of the Olympics in making application to sports. The Olympic Games began, I should say, began in the first four-year cycle that we know of in 776 B.C. According to historians, for the, for the next 1170 years, the Olympic Games would be played every four years. They did not cease until A.D. 393. That's incredible. At the beginning of the Olympic Games, the only competition was just a 200-yard run. That's what they did. The Olympic Games was a 200-yard race, and they just allowed people to do it until the winners were finally selected. That distance was known as a stadium in Greek, which gets our name for that oval track, which would be run uh, for 200 yards, and that was a distance in Greek. Well, over time, that developed into lots of other things for spectators, and many, many other games were added, other races, uh, wrestling, chariot races, and all kinds of competitions. 
And of course, we're very familiar with our modern Olympic Games. There have always been people who wanted to watch people participate in sports. Tonight's event with the, uh, the Super Bowl is it's hard to imagine the real numbers. It's said that a, somewhere on the neighborhood of 120 million people are expected to watch the Super Bowl. If you want to know how much advertisers uh, think of this event, all you've got to do is look at the rate. Advertisers on the commercials or for the commercials in the Super Bowl do something of their own competition. And each ad seems like it tries to top the others. A lot of people just watch the Super Bowl for the commercials. They'll be on the Internet tonight and for the coming weeks, and they'll have their own little competition. You know how much it costs to put an ad on for the Super Bowl this year? A little over $100,000 a second to put an ad on the Super Bowl. $3.5 million for a 30-second ad if you want to buy one. That's hard to believe. That's because they know people are going to watch. Maybe you're going to be one of them. Tonight I'd like to, for a few minutes, talk about some of the things we can learn as Christians from sports. And actually, there turned out to be, uh, as I started making my preparations, way more topics than I knew I'd have time for, unless you plan to stay with me all night, and uh, I don't figure you do. So I'll limit our discussion to four. Number one, the best athletes never quit training. Best athletes never quit training. Let's go back and read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. There are a number of the books in Scripture that are comforting, that offer consolation, which describe... Um, I'm not sure what passage I told you to turn to. It should have been Hebrews chapter 5. I'm thinking now in history, and I said, I don't think I said 5. But chapter tw uh, 5, verse 12 is where I'm going to start. There are a lot of passages or, or uh, books in Scripture that are of comfort. This is not one of them. In Hebrews 5, 12, the author has a sharp rebuke for these folks. Now, we don't know exactly that there is a, a, a location uh, connected to the people who, are, who received the book of Hebrews. As it is uh, given, it, is to, it would be to all of those who were raised in the Jewish religion of the Jewish nation who had become Christians. And listen to how he discusses life with them. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. When the writer of Hebrews looked at their lives, he saw Christians who he said were immature. They were not prepared. One of the things that will mark the men who will play tonight in that game will be that they will be, for the most part, very prepared. They will have had a couple of weeks off, and during that time there will have been an extensive amount of training, both uh, in their tactics and in their physical presentation, keeping them ready to go. But as you look to professional athletes, they never quit, regardless of who they are. I was reading an article some time back about Tiger Woods, who may not be the ideal uh, sports figure anymore to use as an illustration, but nonetheless... Uh, one who was, at least for a period of time, known as being one of the top performers in his field and talked about the amount of time that he was spending in training even while he was winning everything. He didn't just go out and play the game. He was also training regularly. 
the men who are being competing in the very and women in the various sporting events at a professional level, they never quit preparing themselves for that competition. When Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2.15, King James Version translates that study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Other translations describe that as be diligent to prepare yourselves so that God will be approved of your preparation. The concept identified there is as workmen of God, as Christians who stand before God, we should be those who handle properly God's Word. Those in the book of Hebrews 5 didn't do so. I wonder, and I'm not going to stay on this for just a second. I just want to put a, a thought in your heart. I wonder if we really believed that we needed to know the Word of God would we prepare ourselves differently? There are at least two areas where our understanding of God's Word is important. One is in knowledge. The second is in application. And in all sporting events, some train because they have to, some train because they want to. And you can usually tell the difference. Number two, a second lesson we'll learn from uh, sports, winning athletes set goals. I ran across an article some time back, and it had a, a description of uh, some of the stories behind the 2010 uh, Winter Olympic Games that were uh, done up in Canada, in Calgary, or Vancouver, I should say. And uh, there were some amazing stories. And I, I wish I had time to describe more of them, but I don't. I remember running across a statement years and years ago that said the difference in a wish and a goal is a plan. Some of you are involved in leadership uh, activities with your work or other uh, professional organizations understand there's a lot of leadership things that, that are out that uh, are available to you and little pithy sayings, but that's a pithy saying that's, that's valuable. The difference in a wish and a goal is a plan. There are a lot of people who have wishes. I wish, I wish I was thinner. I wish I was healthier. I wish I, and you could fill in the blank, whatever it is you wish you had. And if that's all you ever do, then you'll never get any closer to it than that. It's just a wish. But the difference in being able to pursue something is setting a goal where you actually put something down either in print or in your mind where you say, this is where I want to be. Let's go ahead and read from Philippians chapter 3. Verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet I indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus had also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I know what I'm after. I'm after that goal and nothing else. J.R. Selsky won a bronze medal in U.S. speed skating in uh, 2010. What's interesting about him is that five months earlier, while he was in a, uh, a training event, he fell, and a competitor fell into him and cut him with his skate. Now, figure uh, speed skaters, um, I don't know if you've ever, if you've watched this sport, but I don't remember having seen athletes who have quite the specific physique 
of speed skaters. Their, their thighs are enormous. That is virtually the only real part of their body that they work out to the level uh, of their competition. And, um, I mean, they're fit all over, but that part of their body is just incredible. He had a six-inch cut across the top of his thigh, two inches deep. The medical doctors, after examining, some of them said he will never compete again. J.R. Selsky had been planning his whole life for these events. In 2006, he was unable to compete in the Winter Games because he was too young. It wasn't because he didn't win. He won the competition in the tryouts, but he was too young to be able to compete. And from that day forward, he said, every single day of my life, I was dreaming about Vancouver in 2010. And so when his leg was cut, the coaches said, we don't know if he'll be able to compete or not. Eight weeks before the competition, he was still on crutches. But when they finally let him back out on the ice, and he started to try to regain his ability, the coach who was watching him said, I have never seen an athlete put out so much effort in my life. He has a single-minded focus to win. That was Paul's focus. He had a goal, and that goal was, I am going to give up everything there is so that I can be in Christ. A third observation or lesson we might learn from athletes is winning athletes keep going regardless. Playing hurt and playing through pain, those are the normal things that uh, athletes go through. It is amazing when we look at Christianity how sometimes feeble we are. There are people who quit going to church or quit local congregations because someone offends them or someone hurts their feelings or something else occurs in life which in some way discourages them and they just give up, they quit. 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 24. Listen to Paul's history. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and the day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness besides all these other things what comes upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches who is weak and I'm not weak who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation if I must boast I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity brethren we have no right whatsoever to complain when things go wrong with us or things go wrong with our church or things get in our way or somebody makes us mad or whatever not if we really mean it. No athlete would stop just because of a little pain. Petra Magic was from Slovenia. Her sport was cross-country skiing. That sport is another very physical sport, as all of the, the uh, uh, many of the Olympic, Winter Olympic Games are. But uh, this requires um, virtually running across through the snow. In training for the, the meet in the warm-up, she got off the course, went off, the, uh, off a little cliff, fell into a rocky hole about 10 feet deep, and they had to dig her out. Well, it was just very, very shortly before the beginning of their, uh, of their race. They wanted to take her to the hospital right there. She refused to go. She wanted to compete. She'd been working for eight years to get ready to, play, to compete in this game. She says, I am going to compete. So she competed. She met the race. She finished the course. She won the bronze medal. After she finished the race, they took her to the hospital. She had four broken ribs and a collapsed lung. And she competed in cross-country 
skiing. I had a collapsed lung and one broken rib, and I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want anybody to move me. The difference is in what our goals are. Number four, winning athletes don't let losses stop them. When I read the stories of the apostles around the death of Jesus, it is, it is truly heartbreaking. These men... What they would do would be great, but what they knew at that time was so limited, they didn't understand who Jesus was, what Jesus was, or what their place would be in life. They would go on to do great things, but they were, they were in terrible pain. They'd lost their leader. They'd lost their purpose. They'd lost their confidence. They didn't know where they were going in the period of time during the 40 days, especially between the crucifixion of Jesus and his um, return to um, to heaven, they struggled. In Acts chapter 7, the, the Jews raised up and killed Stephen. In Acts chapter 8, Paul rose up and began a persecution of the church, which, uh, which decimated the early church. Uh, as he described his own events later in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, he said, I did everything that was possible to destroy the church. I put them in prison. I put them to death. I did everything I could to hurt those people. But they didn't stop through their losses. The classic discussion of this, I think, is found in Acts chapter 5. There are many others. But this one is suitable. In Acts chapter 5, and I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Verse 28. The high priest said to them, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. They said, we're not going to quit. You took our leader, and we have loss, but we won't quit. I read about a Canadian figure skater. Her name was Joni Rochette. She was described by her mother a week before the Olympic events in these terms. She has great confidence in herself. She believes in her dreams. The hurdles that she faces motivate her to rise above them. She is naturally determined and persevering. What interesting words. Two hours after her family arrived at the Olympic Stadium in Vancouver, her mother died of a heart attack. Two days later, this girl, now with... Her mother's death, two days old, had to stand before an Olympic crowd and go out onto the ice. Her dad was there. And those who were present described her as stepping out tentatively onto that ice, biting her lip to keep back the tears. But she performed, took home a bronze medal. I'm certain that there are lots of you who can appreciate the kind of stamina that it took for that young lady to be able to do anything, but much less compete on a world level in an Olympic competition with such a great tragedy. There will be times when each of us, as Christians, will suffer loss in our lives. Sometimes it'll be people whom we hold strong ties to, that we have strong spiritual ties to, who were our mentors, who were our examples, who taught us, who held us, who encouraged us. And when they're gone, then we'll have to decide how we're going to go forward from that point on. I knew a young man a number of years ago who, while his parents were living, he was relatively faithful to the Lord. But after his mom died, first his dad, then his mom, he gave up all semblance of religious life and simply drifted. 
One of the lessons that we can learn from sports is that athletes never quit training. A second is that we set goals for ourselves if we really mean to accomplish something. A third is there will be times when things push us aside and we will have to play hurt. We will have to go through injury. We will have to play through the pain. And there will be times when we suffer loss. And then what are we going to do? Let's conclude in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you'd like to read with me beginning in verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God, not in us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in our body, excuse me, in the body, the dying of the Lord, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. But we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul said, yes, we're going to suffer things, but the glory that we hold on to is the fact that we demonstrate the life of Jesus as we live. And that's a thought we'll carry with us. As we go through each day, we demonstrate, if we are children of God, Jesus in us. Tonight, are you a Christian? If not, there are things that you need to do in order to obtain the promise of eternal life. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the risen Savior, would you confess that before this audience? Would you be baptized for the mission of your sins and raised to walk a new life? It may be that you have begun that race, but you've allowed things to push you aside. Maybe the injuries or the tragedies or the losses or the pain have caused you to quit serving, quit running that race. It's time for you to get back in it. If we can assist you spiritually tonight in a public way, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. for that lesson uh, it's a good lesson and a little tie in the Super Bowl there I wasn't sure where he was going with all that to start with I thought he might be going to go with maybe David and the Giants or the Giant rather or you know maybe uh, Nehemiah's rally with the great uh, Jerusalem Patriots to take the walls and build them back up again but nevertheless it turned out well 259 I mean I'm sorry 136 we are closing him 136 and um we have the Lord's Supper prepared tonight still. If you'd like to make your way to the foyer at this time, you can be shown where you can be served if you need it this evening. Sing the first and, and um, last stanzas before our closing prayer. <clears throat> Faith of our fathers,
us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day. Thank you for all of our blessings. As we dismiss tonight, we pray that you'll help us to have a super evening and help us to uh, run a good hard race this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.